Hi there, welcome to the eighth episode of the design and construction of a curve tracer. Today we will spend some time at the desk and in the lab to see how to generate the characteristics of a transistor and how to interpret them. Let's get into the subject with no further ado. Let's start one more time with a schematic that shows how the curve tracer connects to the device under test. In this case, our device under test, or DUT, is a transistor which has three pins and some specific testing requirements. The three pins of the transistor are the collector, the base and the emitter. To test it with the curve tracer and get meaningful results, we need to connect the emitter to ground which in this setup is the lower block of the DUT connector. We will also place a resistor R2 in series with the emitter. This resistor allows us to measure the current flowing through the transistor by converting it into a voltage that can be read on the y-axis of the oscilloscope. The collector of the transistor will be connected to the top block of the DUT connector. Resistor R1 is placed in series with the collector and acts as a load for the transistor. The curve tracer is designed so that we can choose from a range of resistors or use no resistor at all, depending on the specific test needs. Now, the voltage ramp generated by the curve tracer will enter the transistor. We will measure the voltage of the collector and display it on the x-axis of the oscilloscope. This setup allows us to plot the collector current against the VCE, the collector emitter voltage. This is possible because the collector and the emitter current in a transistor are almost identical. Additionally, the voltage drop across R2 is negligible compared to the VCE, thanks to the very low value of R2. Now, let's address the base of the transistor. If we leave it unconnected, the transistor will act as an open circuit, and we won't be able to generate any characteristics. The base controls the transistor's behavior based on the current flowing through it. Therefore, we will need to use a current to drive the base. For different values of the base current, the transistor will exhibit different current-to-voltage characteristics. To get a complete set of data, we need to generate several characteristics for different base current values, and this is where the ladder signal comes in. By using the ladder generator output, which produces a voltage, and feeding it to the Howland current pump, we can convert that voltage into a current signal in the form of a ladder. In other words, the current value changes with each step of the ladder. Since these steps are synchronized with the voltage ramp, we can generate multiple current versus voltage characteristics, one for each step in the ladder. All these characteristics can be generated quickly and repeatedly, in sync with the frequency of the ladder signal. The persistence function of the oscilloscope will help, allowing us to see all the transistor characteristics at once on the screen. Now, let's head to the lab to see how all of this works in practice. I have already connected the transistor to the red, green and yellow probes. The collector to the red, the emitter to the yellow and the base to the green. I am now zeroing both ramp and ladder signal levels. I will increase them back later on, but first let's look at the oscilloscope screen to see what happens when ramp and ladder signals are increased. Once again, the oscilloscope is set to show an XY representation of the signals at the two inputs, the yellow and the blue. The yellow input represents the X-axis, the blue input represents the Y-axis, which is practically the current flowing through the transistor between collector and emitter. Increasing now the ramp level, and you see that we obtain a flat horizontal line. And that is because there is currently no current applied to the transistor base, and therefore the transistor behaves like an open switch. Let's now inject some current into the base, and let's increase it a little bit. 
That is done by increasing the level of the ladder signal. And look, the characteristic of the transistor started to appear, increasing a little more the base current. And you see, since I have used an NPN transistor, particularly the 2N2222, all the significant characteristics are on the first quadrant of the XY reference system, or in other words, on the top right of the picture. Since we care only for that area, we can move the origin of the reference system to the bottom left, so we can expand the view of the useful part of the characteristics. Notice how now the characteristic on the top shows a sign of saturation. And that's because we have reached the limit of the transistor itself. In fact, if I reduce the base current, we exit from the saturation area and all the curves become smooth. Here, this seems to be the limit condition without any saturation. All of this is done with an 8 steps ladder. Let's switch now to the 4 steps ladder to see the difference. Note how now we have less clutter on the screen, but we have also lost some of the characteristics, practically losing some of the resolution. Note also those extra lines present on the screen, less pronounced than the actual characteristics. Those lines are caused by the return of the ladder and the ramp signals. They are supposed to be perfectly vertical, but in reality that cannot be, because an electric signal cannot decay instantly, due to the capacity and inductance on the wires, and the transistors having an intrinsic small capacity at each of the two junctions. Since my oscilloscope is very fast, we can definitely see those lines. An oscilloscope with a smaller bandwidth would show fainter return lines, or no lines at all. Let's now take a snapshot of the two screens, so we can analyze the characteristics offline. This is for the 4 steps view, and this is for the 8 steps view. Let's now go back to the desk to see how to read these diagrams. Here on the left is the snapshot of the characteristics taken with a 4 steps ladder. And here on the right is the snapshot taken with the 8 steps ladder. As you can see, the two diagrams are very similar to each other. Basically, the diagram on the right shows extra lines in between of those obtained with the 4 lines diagram on the left. This just means that with the diagram on the right we have a higher resolution because we can see more details of the transistor. That said, let's concentrate on one single diagram. Whatever we say for it remains valid also for the other. For simplicity, let's pick the left diagram. Now, think of this diagram as a graph with two axes. The x-axis shows the voltage between the collector and the emitter of the transistor. The sensitivity of the oscilloscope is set to 2V per division, and this means that each big square on the horizontal axis represents 2V. So, since the graph line moves 5 squares from the origin to the right, the VCE in this position is 10V. The y-axis shows instead the collector current, which is actually the current flowing from the collector to the emitter. Since the y-axis is set to 500 mV per division, it means that each big square on the vertical axis represents 500 mV. But, since the measure really refers to the voltage drop across the 1 ohm resistor in the emitter circuit, based on the ohm's law we are practically reading 500 mA per division. So now, what those curved lines really represent? They represent the transistor behavior. Each line represents a different base current provided by the steps of the ladder. The base current is a small current that flows into the base of the transistor and controls the much larger collector current. The higher the base current, the higher the collector current, and so the lines higher up on the screen mean more base current that causes more collector current and each line is generated by stepping the base current to a new value. The shape of the lines shows how the collector current changes as we change the collector emitter voltage for a specific value of base current. So, how do we read the screen? Look at the x-axis. 
find the point where you want to know the VCE. For example, if you want to know what's happening at 4 volt, start by finding the 4 volt mark on the x-axis. This one, since this point represents the origin of the graph. Now look at the y-axis. Find the curve you are interested in for a certain base current. This one, for example. Then follow the curve up to the point that corresponds to the VCE from the previous step. Now read the y-axis value, and that is the collector current. Always remember the scales, in this case it is 2 volt per division on the x-axis, and 500 mA per division on the y-axis. Understand the curves. Once again, each curve represents a different base current. By looking at the spacing between the curves, we can see how much the collector current changes for a given change in the base current. The problem is, we don't know the values of the base currents. We don't know those because we have used a potentiometer to establish the amount of current for each step of the ladder, and we don't have an exact measurement for it. At this point, we understand that in order to have a complete picture of the transistor characteristics, we need to know each and every value of base current used to generate those characteristics. With that information, we can finally determine the key parameters of the transistor and use them to make the necessary calculations to use the transistor in one of our projects, or to verify that it works according to specs. To find the base current for each characteristic curve, we can either measure it directly at the transistor's base, or, alternatively, we can use another interesting and simpler method which I'll show you in the next video. So get ready for it, and in the meantime, happy experiments!